Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton will join us in studio to discuss a variety of city issues and we'll hear about the legal concerns for startup businesses. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simon. State legislative Democrats announced an education funding plan today. The Democrats are calling for $4 billion to go through K-12 through traditional public and charter schools over the next 10 years. That includes $278 million in immediate funding from the state's budget surplus. Democrats would also like to see a freeze on the corporate school tuition tax credit, which they say diverts money from public schools to private schools. The governor's office dismissed the Democrats' plan as irresponsible and little more than a press release that would force tax hikes. And the contempt of court hearing for Sheriff Joe Arpaio continued today with a focus on an MCSO investigation of the judge hearing the case. U.S. District Court Judge Murray Snow questioned Chief Deputy Jerry Sheridan about an informant who alleged that a conspiracy existed between the judge and the U.S. Justice Department involving racial profiling suits against the MCSO. Sheridan denied the informant was paid to investigate the judge and that the Sheriff's Department was only interested in allegations that the federal government had hacked into local bank accounts. Phoenix Mayor uh, Greg Stanton appears on Arizona Horizon each month to discuss top city issues, including efforts to increase trade with Mexico and a move to outfit more police officers with body cameras. Joining us now is Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton. Good to see you again. Thanks Good for to see you, Ted. Here. Thanks for having me on. Let's talk about this trade office. We just had the Council General and the Pro Mexico, uh, the head of Pro Mexico here, uh, the office here in studio last night. Your thoughts now on this and the efforts to increase trade? Uh, it's been one of our most successful uh, endeavors. When I became uh, Mayor, I made a commitment that we were going to do all we can to increase trade with Mexico, our, already our number one trading partner, but a vast growing economy, a vast growing middle class, and instead of treating Mexico like somehow they're our enemies, we know that they are our long-term economic partners. I've been down there 13 times on various trade missions, bring, bringing business leaders to Mexico. Phoenix opened up our Mexico trade office ourselves in partnership with the state of Arizona. And now, despite all of the political uh, challenges that we have had, the government of Mexico has made this very important decision, and that is to open up a pro-Mexico office here in Phoenix, Arizona. Pro-Mexico will there be trade and investment office uh, here. I challenged this community in my state of the city last year. We're gonna double exports to Mexico in five years, double all exports across the globe in 10 years. And if you look at the numbers that were reported recently about how well we are doing, we are well on our way to accomplishing those goals and going well beyond those goals. Trade with Mexico is critically important for the future of our economy. It's a, a, obviously a good thing that Pro-Mexico opened this office, but they have a number of offices in a number of other places. This is the first time they've opened one in Arizona. How much was trade hurt in recent years by political concerns? Well, first off, it's about time they opened up an yes. office here. The, the fact is, is that they do have 10 or 12 of these offices around the United States of America, and they did their business involving Phoenix out of the Los Angeles um, uh, office. And in part, it was because of the unfortunately adversarial relationship that had been created between our state government and the, and the state of Sonora and the country of, uh, of Mexico, unnecessarily. I believe we shot ourselves in the foot from a economic percep perception, from a trade perspective uh, as well. And so it was really up to myself when I became mayor and Mayor Rothschild of Tucson, we decided that cities were gonna lead the way to improving this relationship. And now that there's been a change in governor, I'm proud that Governor Ducey's been down there uh, leading a trade delegation uh, as well. And I believe this is a, a tremendous turn the page moment in our state's history. Instead of viewing Mexico as an adversary of some sort, let's understand that for our economy, for jobs here in Phoenix, Arizona, growth of trade with Mexico is critically important. And yes, the divisive bills that we passed, including 1070, did hurt us economically uh, in our community. Concern that uh, election rhetoric, rhetoric will uh, reopen old wounds? Unfortunately, uh, yes, with uh, Donald Trump and some of the racist language that he's used on the uh, campaign trail, uh, we're again presenting Mexico as our adversary, almost our enemy when it comes to uh, our economy. When we know here in Phoenix, Arizona, just the opposite uh, is true. So yes, unfortunately, we're, we are seeing heated rhetoric uh, on, on uh, the, during the uh, presidential race, and Mexico is paying close attention. I hope and pray that those that engage in that sort of behavior are not successful in taking the White House, because again, 
We need a good working relationship with Mexico. And oh, by the way, we have some challenges as well. The fact that we need to work together to stop the drug cartels and any kind of violence associated with that, we're partners in that effort. But somehow, I think, I think some people took the challenges and said, we can't even work on what we have to work on together because of those challenges, when I think the opposite approach is, was the appropriate one. Let's build closer relationships. And yet critics will say, uh, are you partners as well in terms of stopping the tide of illegal immigration? Well, the, the, the answer is yes. But first and foremost, we have to get our own house in order here in the United States of America. And I'm proud that our two senators, Senator McCain and Flake, were part of the famous Gang of Eight that came up with what I thought was a very strong proposal for comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, and that would have had a, eventually a path to, to citizenship. It wasn't going to be an easy path to citizenship, but it would have allowed for a path to citizenship, not for people that have come here and committed crimes, but for people that have come here are working for DREAMAX students, uh, et cetera. And I would politely argue that no city, no region in the country would benefit more from the passage of comprehensive immigration reform than here in, uh, in Phoenix, uh, Phoenix, Arizona. So both sides have to do their part, but I think uh, it's important that now is the time. We shouldn't wait another day. Now is the time that we finally pass comprehensive immigration uh, uh, reform. It would be great for our economy. Uh, $4.8 million grant from the Justice Department for body cameras for police officers. Talk to us about this. Well, that's in part We received a total of $4.8 million in various types of grants. One of the grants we received okay. was for body cameras. One of them, by the way, was for 25 Five new police officers for the city of Phoenix. So we already had a plan to increase police officers well over 400 over the next four years. We're going to get close to 500 as a result of, of one of the grants. The other grant was to add about 150 or so new body cameras um, to the streets of Phoenix, not just in one precinct like they are now. Right now, all of the cameras are deployed in Maryville. These will be citywide, and we're going to do some serious studying about behaviors of officers who are wearing the cameras, about the behavior of citizens who know that the officer uh, has a camera on them. I believe, I'm very optimistic, it's going to show that, um, that uh, violence goes down, that citizens are safer, police officers are safer, or with those cameras. But we're not, going to, we're not going to guess on that. We're going to actually do a detailed study that's going to get to the bottom of the benefits of body cameras on our, on our, for our police what, officers. What do you expect these cameras? What do you think the cameras will accomplish? Well, I do believe that the cameras will accomplish um, safety, that citizens will be safer, they know they'll be, on, they'll be on camera, they'll behave differently, officers will know that their actions and their words uh, are being recorded, and they may act in a different way as well. We want community safety, we want safety for members of the public, we want our officers to be as safe as possible. And I do believe that cameras are one important step. It's not, it's not a panacea, it's not a be all end all, but I do believe that it, when, when we do the study and show the benefits of it and then we deploy cameras uh, to the entire force, which I do believe will happen in the not too distant uh, future, that this is, the, this is the direction that we are going, that'll be one additional tool in our toolbox for officer and community safety. Uh, not too distant future for the cameras, what about the new police officers, when do they hit the streets? Uh, we, we believe that they're going to be hitting the streets. We have the authorization to uh, buy these cameras almost right away. And then ASU is designing the studies. I think in the next few weeks and months, just in the, the very near future, you're going to see these cameras uh, on the streets. And again, we want to make sure we get it right. By the way, it's important to note that we have to get the technology right, not just the camera technology, right. but the data collection and management. As you can imagine, when those cameras are on for much of an officer's shift, it collects a lot of data. We got to make sure that data is collected in a way that can be used by the court system, that we have have a policy as it relates to public records requests, et cetera, that we have a smart plan for body right. cameras. My question was, when do those additional officers hit the streets? My, the chief has told me in the next few weeks and months. It'll just be in the, in the next, oh, the officers. Oh, officers. I, oh we're, in the, we're hiring right now. I thought you were talking about the cameras. No, no. We are in the process of hiring those new officers. We have authorization to hire them right, right away. Now, the chief, if he were sitting here, and I know he occasionally does, he would tell you that we want to hire as many as possible, as quickly as possible, but only if they meet our very difficult standards for our officers. We're not going to lower the standards for hiring officers one iota simply because we're hiring such a large volume of officers. So anybody watching at home, if you have a son or daughter or a fr family friend that you think might be interested in a career in law enforcement, there's never a better time in the history of the Phoenix Police Department than right now to get a job with the best police department in the country. All right, on we go to the uh, bike share program. The council votes to expand the bike share program, not a unanimous vote by any stretch. Some folks are kind of wondering, talk to us about this. 
Why was this expanded when the utilization rate is under 50%? Well, first off, uh, I think the current bike share program, which was, which was a modest program to start out with, has been successful. It has been successful in terms of increasing the breadth of the light rail system. So many of the, of the bike shares are along the light rail system and allow somebody that may have a meeting or a, or a, a meeting a friend or a doctor appointment that's a, a mile or so away from light rail to use light rail because they get on that bike and they can complete that uh, last mile. So when you say the utilization rate, I, think there, I don't think that the program has been unsuccessful in any regard. First, every great city needs to be a multimodal city. So I think offering bike share as an option for the people of Phoenix has been important. And now we want to provide it in more places. And so the city of Phoenix is uh, is been very supportive of the program and continues to be supportive of the program as you're going to see more and more of those beautiful green bikes throughout the city of Phoenix. Is it worth it? Well, certainly I've been a champion of, uh, of bike share. And I know I talk to my peers around the country who say that if you want to be a great multimodal city, bike share is part of the larger package. So is improving light rail. So is improving bus service making the city more bikeable in terms of um, a thousand miles of bike lanes, which we're doing in the city of Phoenix as a result of Proposition 104, being more walkable, more bikeable, and something like bike share, which is used by a lot of tourists, et cetera, is a, is a, is a strong part of our, uh, of our uh, overall policy of providing uh, multimodal options for the people of Phoenix. But the provider, correct me if I'm wrong, the provider was supposed to pay for all the upfront costs originally. Is that still the plan or is the city now going to be paying for this program? All, the that only, again is about 40% utilization rate. Sure. The only thing that the city's paying for is we're buying some bike rack infrastructure that we will have. So look, if this, if this particular operator doesn't make it, I'm committed to bike share. I've seen it in other cities and how it benefits. We want to make sure that we, if we invest in it, we're not just giving money to an operator. We're, we're investing in the infrastructure. So if another operator has to come in, they're going to be able to utilize that infrastructure that the people of the city of Phoenix own. So I believe it's a smart investment by the city. All right, last point here, uh, the Phoenix Suns new arena. That's the, a lot of talk. Are you talking to Robert Sarver about a new arena? Yes. What, uh, are, you, what are you saying to him? What's he, what's, <laughs> but more important, what's he saying to you? I love Horizon, but I don't want to negotiate on this wonderful television show. I will only say that conversations are going very well. I am committed to making sure that the Phoenix Suns stay in downtown as they've been for decades now. It's been a wonderful relationship between Phoenix Suns and the uh, city of Phoenix. And I know we're talking to others as well. Obviously, I'm well aware that the Coyotes have only two more years on their agreement. Are you talking um, to them? Yes. The Coyote. You, so you are talking to them. Yes. I, I, as I've stated on this show before and elsewhere, I didn't talk to them about taking anything away from the existing contract previously when they had a long-term contract or anything over the next two years. They've got a contract for the next two years, but obviously they've got a plan for their mm -hmm. future as well they should. And if Phoenix can be a part of helping that franchise win Stanley Cups and bring the Stanley Cup to Phoenix, Arizona, and it can be done in downtown Phoenix. I think that would be a great thing for the city. And Mr. Sarver is a, not only is, a, is, a, is the owner of the team, he's a community booster. He's very active in this, uh, in this community. And to his credit, he's been very open-minded about exploring a variety of options. So the talks are still re relatively uh, early. Everyone comes to the table with an open mind. And as I sit here, I have a very, very high level of confidence that we're going to reach a long-term agreement with the Phoenix Suns and they're going to continue to play their basketball here in Phoenix and someday bring an NBA championship to Phoenix, Arizona. What about Chase Field? Uh, should the city, do you think the city should take ownership of Chase Field? And if so, what kind of cost are we talking about? Well, for the very reason that I did not talk to the Coyotes about anything during the pendency of their contract with the city of Glendale, that would be totally inappropriate. Anything I've said here tonight only has to do with the time period after their contract. The uh, Diamondbacks, who I love, uh, on the baseball field, they have a long-term agreement with Maricopa County. And mm -hmm. so any talk about the city of Phoenix taking ownership is premature. Uh, I think that, and so I, I don't feel comfortable talking about that on the air only because they have an existing contract with uh, Maricopa County. How much, let's look back to the arena then. Sure. Uh, and if, if, if in the future if we, you take over from the county, Chase Field as well, but in general, how much have those arenas, stadiums, what have you, actually helped downtown because a lot of folks say boondoggle no more taxpayer money for this stuff it doesn't realistically tangibly help downtown sure i i, I think it would be a stretch to for anyone to suggest that u.s airways arena formerly america airways arena now talking stick arena in downtown phoenix hasn't been 
tremendously important. Anyone who suggests otherwise, I think it's just false. Here's is saying, giving you false information. Here's why. That, are, that arena not only has uh, Suns game, Mercury game, Rattler games, it has activities year round. Obviously, when the biggest concerts come to town, where do they go? More often than not, Talking Stick Arena in downtown Phoenix. That provides incredible vibrancy in our downtown. When we hosted the Super Bowl, that, was, that arena was busy every night, not only providing for Suns games, but also uh, major concerts and events. A great downtown has to have an arena uh, that is cutting edge. Uh, that arena has stood the test of time. It's still an outstanding arena. I went to the Mercury game just a couple days ago uh, uh, myself and watched the, the team lose, unfortunately, but the, they should have won that game. Tough call. <laughs> tough call, tough, at the, call. tough yeah. call at the end. But my point is that it depends on the terms of the deal. It doesn't mean that every deal is the right deal for Phoenix, but having a world-class arena that can compete for the very best events, events of the highest magnitude, when the biggest shows come to town, we want those shows in downtown Phoenix, Arizona. So we wouldn't have the downtown we have, or we would have a lesser downtown without those facilities. We have a great downtown. It's wonderfully vibrant with arts and culture, Roosevelt Row, Grand Avenue, and the arena. All of it comes together to make a ground da great downtown. But, the, but the, having the arena downtown has been critically important for the development, this ongoing great development that we see happening in the heart of our city. All right, Mayor, always a pleasure. Good to have you here. Thanks for having me on. Financing for startups can be a daunting task, and it's more than just raising the required funds. Many new business owners could be violating federal and state laws as they work to raise capital. Here to talk about the pitfalls involved with raising money for startup businesses is Stephen Reed of Jennings, Strauss, and Salmon. Good to have you here. Welcome to Arizona Horizon. Appreciate it. What are some of the pitfalls? For, you know, startup businesses, you got all these great ideas and all these plans. You're saying you got to know what's going on out there, don't you? Absolutely. Um, there are lots of uh, pitfalls that companies need to look out for. Um, I work with businesses all over the state of Arizona and they're all different. And because of that, they have different capital structure needs. Um, you know, one business that might be running a restaurant is completely different from a technology company. So I would think one of the biggest legal pitfalls is understanding what your business is and what the capital structure should look like. What works for one company might not work for a different company. Um, along with that, for, for example, uh, one company might need debt versus actually selling equity or shares of stock or interest in a, a limited liability company. Um, regardless of whether it's debt or equity, corporation or limited liability company, it's important for companies to know that uh, they are selling a security. And when you are selling a security, you need to comply with both the federal and the state laws that go along with that. And, and you mentioned uh, defining the business structure here, whether you're the sole proprietorship or, or you're talking uh, selling security. I mean, you have to know going in, don't you? Because every single avenue literally is its own street. Correct, correct. Um, you know, whenever you're bringing on some, as an investor, you need to be aware that you're, develop, you're putting together a relationship there. And that's more likely than not a long-term relationship. So I think, one, it's important for the company and the investor to align expectations. They know what the exit event looks like. They both understand what the company does and what it's doing. and and uh, you know whether that company will be selling the business down the road or whether this is a long-term business and somehow the investor gets its money in one way or another. Uh, it's important to align those expectations. I think that's an important key component that businesses sometimes overlook. They're so quick to wanting to get the money in the door. That they, stop to, they, they, they don't step back and think, is this investor a good fit for me? Um, 
is this investor understand what my business is? Does this investor have the same expectations as I'm having for my business? Um, otherwise, uh, often you end up with messy situations down the road. That's why it's really important to maybe try to think of these legal pitfalls before you take the money in um, so you can try to hedge against some of those risks or think against some things you should do to hedge against that. How binding are some of these expectations? If I want to open Ted's Hamburger Hamlet and I sure. see it as a little mom and pop thing that down the road it's going to be still a mom and pop thing, I tell you about it and you think Ted's Hamburger Hamlet's going to have you know 50,000 uh, franchisees all over the country and it doesn't happen, it stays a mom and pop. How binding are the original conversations? I mean, what kind of paperwork is involved? What, what, what's happening here? Absolutely, I think there's a couple different things going on there. One, uh, you're subject to federal and state securities laws. And depending on what you say, it's important you don't use untruthful information or you don't lead an investor you don't give them false information or false expectations. That's a sort of a statutory component. Another component is the contract law area where if you're going to bring in an investor and there's going to be that relationship there, it's important probably that there's some contract provisions in there. What are some of those provisions? Well, possibly um, you know, I sell a security to you and I want to be your partner a year down the road all of a sudden you want to sell your security and get rid of it and you want to sell it to somebody else. Well, I might not be excited about having that individual as my business partner. So it's important that you have some also some contractual provisions in there that either limit or restrict someone's ability to get rid of their security or what happens on death or what happens in all those different situations. Um, so you as a company are knowing who your partner is and you uh, are working with the people you want to work with. Are these common errors or common oversights? I mean it, it sounds like, it almost sounds like you can't prepare too much for this sort of thing. I agree, uh, absolutely. You know the common saying of um, you know an ounce of prevention is worth a a pound of cure is absolutely true here. It's important that a business does step back when they're looking, how are they going to fund the company? Well, what capital structure works for them? What investors would they like? How are they going to raise that money? It's important that they step back and think through all these different uh, issues before they sell the security because unfortunately once the security is sold you might have federal and state security problems, but you also might have an arrangement that's not optimal for the company. So it's important to step back and think through these before you uh, ju jump into it. Federal and state law on these uh, types of things, have these laws changed much in recent years, especially after the, the big recession? Absolutely. There's been some exciting developments. Um, it, there was uh, in the Jobs Act at the federal level, uh, the government instructed the SEC to put forth some crowdfunding rules. The SEC did that. Unfortunately, it's about 500 pages worth of uh, proposed rules that have not been finalized yet. And unfortunately, it's uh, cumbersome, it's difficult to comply with, and it's difficult to understand. I don't really know if it's all that helpful to small businesses. Mm -hmm. um, states have gotten involved. They think that crowdfunding is a, an exciting way to raise capital for, young, for small companies, young companies. Um, so there have been a few states who've gone through and they've started, they put together their own crowdfunding laws and Arizona is actually one of those. Um, uh, signed by the governor in April and went into effect in, Ju in uh, July, um, Arizona now has a crowdfunding bill. And how that works is, um, you know, crowdfunding is different from the typical or the historical way that people, companies have raised capital. Usually you raise l well, I should step back and say all securities need to be registered with the SEC or the state agencies unless there's an applicable exemption. A lot of companies who are raising uh, the smaller funds are trying to find an exemption to fit within. Um, usually you do that by raising uh, you know, a signif significant amount of money from a few investors. Mm -hmm. Crowdfunding is a complete change or a change in that where you're raising small amounts of money from lots of people. Um, Arizona now has a bill that allows, there's a law that allows that. Um, it's exciting development, but it is new. Um, we're not sure what's going to happen with there. And there are additional limitations and restrictions in the crowdfunding model that aren't applicable to the other typical historical ways that companies have raised money. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so again, whether it's crowdfunding or whether it's you know, your uncle with a lot of, with a big paycheck or your uncle and his buddies that all kind of want to get into the idea, just in overall terms, if you've got the idea, you're ready to go with it and you're ready to raise money just like what would you, what your, your easiest advice for folks watching right now to think, I, I, I've got this dream, I want it to happen, I've got to get some money for it, but I don't want to get messed up. 
Absolutely. Uh, my biggest piece of advice is to be aware that when you're bringing in money, you are selling a security. So just being aware of that and then taking the next steps, um, you know, which might need to be, you might need to talk to a legal advisor on uh, what you need to do to comply with those. Um, it's often encouraged. Um, but once again, it's that old saying of, you know, the prevention is better than the yeah. cure. Because if you get down the road and you have a relationship that's not working out, or unfortunately, if the investment didn't work out, people often get upset, and that's when it turns to litigation and uh, can become quite costly. So. All right. Good information. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate we appreciate it. it. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.